Hey, howdy everybody. So we're going to get this kicked off now with the class. The previous lecture was more just a rundown of the ground rules, how the course is going to be conducted. Really, this is the beginning of the lectures, more on the technical material that we will be covering, and kind of an introduction to some of the philosophy or methodologies we'll use in designing the workflows that we will develop as a class for subsurface modeling. And so this lecture will include what is subsurface modeling. I've decided I'm going to break up the lectures into smaller pieces, so the other three parts will be recorded in separate sub-lectures. So let's get started. What is subsurface modeling? So really what it is is a calculating a numerical representation of the subsurface. You're trying to build this numerical representation. It's going to be over a specific volume of interest. There's a volume of the subsurface that we want to work with and distinguishing from the other parts of the subsurface that we don't think will be important with regard to whatever scientific or practical industry-based questions that we want to answer. We have a variety of different properties of interest from the subsurface and we want to integrate all possible information sources together in order to be able to build a model that integrates all the uncertainties of these properties of interest from all these information sources over this volume of interest through multiple realizations and scenarios. That's how we represent uncertainty. All of this is done to support decision making. If you don't impact a decision, you don't add value, modeling is all about decision support. So I just kind of jumped through that, those uh, five different concepts. Let's, meet, let's, let's do one slide on each one of those pretty quickly and just talk about what they each mean to us. The volume of interest. It's the volume of the subsurface that we're going to model. It could be 2D. In fact, there are many cases, and we will cover different modeling goals and purposes for which 2D modeling may be sufficient. Now, how do we determine the extent of this volume of interest? Well, it's going to depend on the purpose of the model. A good example of this is if we're interested in just volumetrics in place within a reservoir, then we'd only want to model the reservoir rock. That would be the most efficient thing to do. We're only concerned with the rock and fluids within the reservoir. If we're going to be running forward seismic on the subsurface model, then we also need to model overburden because, of course, seismic is being transmitted from the surface and we're going to be concerned about overburden effects and how the overburden is potentially changing the sweep of the signal through the subsurface. Ge geologic interpretation also matters. If we've done some type of large-scale mapping or modeling, usually this is driven by seismic information geologic interpretation and we determined that there are specific extents that are based on maybe abrupt truncations or onlapping discontinuities and so forth. That's, this may of course tell us the extent of where we want to model. We don't want to go any further because now we're into something different and something that we would no longer consider a reservoir or an aquifer or a gold deposit or whatever the thing of interest in the subsurface is. It's often, a, it's often going to be subset into a variety of regions that are going to be modeled separately. The regions may all have different statistical distributions including univariate, bivariate, spatial, um, even like a higher order multivariate and so forth they may change dramatically between regions and so we want to treat each of them separately. So we start out with some volume of interest and we've broken it up into two separate regions which will have different statistical properties and different geologic concepts and so forth. Then we're going to work with properties of interest. These are measures of the rock and fluid properties. They're informative with regard to 
some type of a subsurface forecast. That could be volumes, volumetrics, just how much oil is in place, how much gold tonnage is available to us that may be recovered, flow rates, recovery factors. These are properties that help us get to the output from our model that's going to help us make the biz business decisions. We're not going to make business decisions based on, our, on porosity distribution. We're going to make them based on how much oil is in place, how much we can recover from a single well. We're going to have a set of direct and indirect measures of the subsurface. It turns out that direct measures of the subsurface are quite limited. They're not that, they're not that common and they don't have great coverage. If you think about it, there's very few cases in which we get to directly measure the subsurface. When we extract a core from the subsurface, we take a core and we pull it up through the well bore, that is an example of something we can directly sample. We can take that core, we can, we can then use it within a test to establish the available poor volumes, effective poor volumes, the permeability, directional permeability, and so forth. That's a direct measure of the subsurface. But it turns out that's very expensive, and we can't do that very often. And so most of our measures will be indirect measures of the rock fluid system. This would include, include wireline, uh, well logs, the seismic information that we have um, seismic attributes that have been inverted in order to tell us something about the subsurface. Okay, so the information sources that we'll have available to us, they'll include, we'll have well-based measures, which would be our direct measures like core, and our indirect measures like our well logs, and then we're going to have our seismic information. Now, of course, we have a lot of other information sources. I don't want to just say um, just those two, seismic and wells. We have the entire effort around large-scale basin analysis in which we've gone through and tried to understand the entire history, payload history, sources, provenance, what type of, um, what was going over time, what are the allogenic and autogenic forcing on the system. There's a lot we can do as far as understand the large-scale paleo environment. Then, of course, we have production data, which really production data is our are one ground truth that we have available to us. We're trying to model and understand extraction of fluids from the subsurface. Production data is ground truth for how the subsurface responds. It could also be mineral grades. It could also be flow rates from water wells. It's all the same thing. Subsurface modeling is all about a data integration challenge. We're going to have this volume of interest we have a property of interest that we're interested in, so this could be porosity. We'll have well, log, well logs available at well A and B. Gamma ray is indicating that we have some type of a fining up looking trend here going on here. We have coarser grained going to finer grain, coarser grain going to finer grain, ind indicating that we're getting more shaly as we the gamma ray going towards the right. And so this, this are all different types of information that we have available to us. Well, of course, and we also have seismic information. And so the seismic information may identify that these blue or kind of, yeah, blue, blue regions are more sand rich. And these other regions that are not denoted as blue have more, are more shale rich, perhaps. And so we're going to integ integrate uncertainty through multiple models. And we're going to take the available information, we're going to build multiple models, and we'll have two different types of models when we talk about mul multiple models. We have realizations. With the realization, you hold all the assumptions constant. You just change the random number seed. Things may change between the data, but the models have fundamental similarities. The statistics, the assumptions, the decisions are all the same. Now, we have uncertainty in our decisions, in our statistics, and so we have to model with scenarios too. A scenario is another model when you change the model assumptions, the decisions, the statistics, and so forth, maybe the method. And so we'll have realizations, we'll have scenarios, we'll build up multiple models, and this is now our uncertainty model of the subsurface. 
Now, once again, we've added no value now. We have not impacted a decision. We have to support decision making in order to add value. And so our models, our multiple models of uncertainty, taken jointly, will be used for decision support. Decisions are going to be made using all scenarios and realizations simultaneously. So we had well A, we had well B, and now we're going to place injectors for a water flood based on looking at all of the multiple models of uncertainty and optimizing all of, over all of them jointly. If we're able to do that, now we've added quite a bit of value. We have provided, given all the information, integrated together, the best decision for where to place our injectors in the case of a hydrocarbon in a reservoir. So let's just go back and just think about what we've done here. What, what have we accomplished with subsurface modeling? What's another way to describe it? It's numerical modeling of the subsurface, which requires two fundamental steps. Quantification, you're going to calculate summary statistics, understand the trends, understand the behaviors of the properties of interest over the subsurface volume of interest. That's quantification. And then we have subsurface modeling, and this is where we're going to take spatial reservoir property distributions from the quantification step, and we're going to now reproduce them. We're going to impose them upon that volume of interest. And so we have our data that's available to us, the seismic data with the regions indicated for sand rich, the wells with the gamma ray logs. We extract all kinds of trends and statistical information, which are just shown um, schematically with these two data sets right here, a histogram and a scatter plot. But of course, there's much more we do. We build multiple subsurface models. We impose them, or we apply them to, I should say, a transfer function, which would be the method by which we calculate the volumetrics, the oil in place, the total grade, the amount of water available, and or maybe flow simulation, where now we're trying to predict, based on physics, the response of the subsurface to our exploitation scheme. Boring wells into the subsurface, completing them and extracting hydrocarbons or water or maybe a mine plan, whatever it might be. We apply this transfer function to each one of these models representing the model of uncertainty and the result is we get a distribution of the property of interest that is a decision criteria, an output from the model, an output from the transfer function like recovery factor, oil in place, and so forth. Once we've done this, this distribution of uncertainty can be summarized. It, we can talk about the P10. We can talk about the P90. We can talk about the P50, the expectation, and so forth. We could apply a loss function or some other type of method, and we can make an optimum decision in the presence of this uncertainty. It can help us in order to make choices about how are we going to develop this project, what are we going to do. Or should we, in fact, drill those wells or not? Or not? Is there enough profit or recovery in order to justify this project? So many questions can be answered when we build these decision criteria distributions from this workflow. Okay, so that's all for now on what subsurface modeling is. I'll talk next about subsurface data and then get into goals and different types of modeling workflows. All right, thank you.